At first light this morning, we flew over Shockwave, and what we found was a town that was drowning. Its inhabitants, thousands of them, had taken to the rooftops with whatever they could salvage. As the floodwaters rise around them, they plead to be rescued. These people marooned on the last rapidly disappearing patch of dry land. And here, mothers begging us to save their children. Within minutes, South African military helicopters arrive, and what we witness is a day of dramatic rescue. This pilot hovers perilously above an overloaded bus and between overhead power lines. It is skillful and brave flying, and these people owe their lives to it. The wheels of this helicopter were in the water as it evacuated the passengers of a stricken truck. The people of Shokwe had no warning of the deluge. It came in the dead of night as they slept. We flew on one mission and witnessed the sheer desperation of the people trapped here. The water had now risen several feet in just a few hours. It had become an undignified scramble for survival. But for these people, particularly the children, fighting their way onto this helicopter could be the difference between life or death. So many people are stranded here, the crews can barely cope. One man refused to let go, even as the helicopter lifted off. Eventually, he was hauled in. With each rescue, there are always people left behind. Those who make it are flown to the nearest dry land, joining others who manage to escape on foot. It is a battle with nature this country is losing. Late this afternoon, thousands remain to be rescued in Chokwe alone. South Africa's rescue crews are doing the best they can, but five helicopters are simply not enough to do the job. This is a crisis that has suddenly worsened, and this evening Mozambique, one of the poorest countries in the world, needs help. Mark Austin, ITN, Chokwe, Mozambique. Um, starting with the cyclone, obviously we can see where the path, I'll just highlight that, the path went through. Uh, it was mostly through around, obviously you see the East African um, coastline and went into the interior, um, devastating all in its path. Um, so this has been unprecedented and we wanted to look at impacts of further climate change on other parts of the continent. And this week, we've had uh, also a climate change summit to take place in Accra, Ghana. Um, it was a three-day summit, I think, uh, from March the 18th to 22nd, um, just passed. And the goal or the aim was to focus on bridging the divide between parties to the UN's push for climate action. Um, in the world um, and obviously in various regions as well. So the purpose for the Africa Climate Week, which is what it was called, uh, was to encourage all countries to raise their climate ambition by the year 2020. And that meant for all stakeholders, both state and non-state, to utilize the opportunity to demonstrate how they are working together uh, to implement the Paris Agreement goals and just to re remind ourselves and that the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement. Um, but that's for another another subject. Okay, so to implement the Paris Agreement goals and limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and enhancing resilience to changing the uh, climate. So how has Africa been Im impacted by climate change? Um, well, many scientists and many um, Western um, sources have cited that Africa will be severely impacted by climate change. In fact, it will be impacted the most, as well as other countries uh, south of the equator. Um, but they are the least polluting entities in the world, but will suffer the brunt the most, if we are to believe what the scientists say. 
Um, so there's been a, a sharp push um, for countries to limit their emissions. Um, we have African countries who pollute less, who have signed up to the, these agreements, but the United States and China, which are the largest polluters in the world, we have China delaying their uh, or, or staggering some of their goals um, for longer periods and the United States pulling out altogether. So this is what we have to face. Uh, where some people don't take um, their fair share of responsibility or, as with Donald Trump, just deny that climate change actually exists. Um, Namdi, with, with the pictures we've seen um, in Mozambique, which also affected neighboring countries, um, I just want to know what your thoughts are. And with the climate week that's just gone by, um, what do you think would be hope to achieve? given that we're the least polluters anyway. Yeah, I just wanted to start by saying that my, um, my thoughts and prayers go, go out to those who've lost uh, loved ones in this recent uh, disaster. Um, I think uh, um, it's just a reflection of uh, current challenges that we we face on the continent. And I also want to stress the fact that uh, climate change represents the greatest threat that the African continent has faced in this century. And why do I say so? Because it is amongst the numerous challenges the continent is facing. This is the only challenge that the continent doesn't actually have any control over. <clears throat> you can see with this recent disaster People were actually sleeping in the dead of the night when this hurricane and when this uh, cycle started. Like you mentioned, there was no uh, emergency warning systems that would have at least um, alerted the people and you know enabled them to take uh, preventive steps towards uh, you know taking you know preventive measures. There was no there was no uh, there was no. Uh, alert system that would have triggered the kind of response. So the people were literally caught on our ways. We can see also from the video that you played in the um, frantic effort that um, uh, rescue organizations had to take the immediate and unplanned you know, measures that they had to take just to rescue people. These are the, the reflection of some of the challenges that the continent will be facing. Just a glimpse. This is actually just a glimpse of the, of the challenges the continent we face. However, we're, um, 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 I'm happy at least we're beginning to have discussions about, about this on the continent, like you highlighted the, uh, the recent climate change summit that was held in Accra, Ghana. And I hope that that uh, discussion was geared towards uh, looking at uh, 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 preventing, preventing uh, responsive uh, uh, response that the, that, the, that the that the countries, individual countries, or uh, the African Union as a body can take to prevent um, an excessive loss of life, ensuring that the continent is in a position to respond to the challenges that we face. I think um, uh, uh, also, uh, I mean, for the fact that we have countries like the United States that are not signatories of the par uh, Paris Change uh, Agreement, it's also a reflection of the fact that, uh, that there are countries that are outside the continent that actually don't, uh, either they're deliberately sabotaging the progress of the continent, but they're actually ignorant about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Trump, like we know, uh, doesn't actually believe it does actually believe in climate change. So I think that's a, a reflection of you know, what is thought process are. But, um, you know, but if you are taking the time to actually look at the devastating impact that this um, climate change is having on, not just the United States, but, you know, predominantly, mainly on the African continent, I think that would uh, um, play, play a major role in shaping the um, understanding about this uh, challenges. So regardless, I think that um, on the continental level, continents should be looking at taking steps to ensure that uh, we are in a position to actually respond to crisis such as this. 
Yeah, I agree. And, and talking about other impacts, I think, across the continent, we know of, um, you know, the Lake Chad region, um, which has, or the Lake Chad itself, which um, borders Niger and Nigeria, um, has dried up. Uh, and that has led to um, supposed migrations from from the northern part of Nigeria to the southern part um, with um, herds, herdsmen having to migrate south and this has caused some clashes between farmers and uh, local farmers uh, in the southern part of Nigeria. In West Africa's Lake Chad region, a crisis that barely makes the headlines is unfolding. Desertification and poverty compounded by Boko Haram's violence have left 11 million people desperately in need of aid, more than 7 million surviving, if they can, on one meal a day. In Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad and Niger, the UN's humanitarian officer for the Sahel region says the young and vulnerable are suffering most. At the moment, with 515 thousand children across the Lake Chad region who we know are either or are about to be severely and acutely malnourished uh, if they don't get the help they need on time they die up to a million people have been cut off from humanitarian aid by Boko Haram despite a regional military offensive against the Islamist militants. The jihadists' insurgency has killed about 15,000 people and forced more than two million others to flee their homes. So this is just one impact of what climate change can do. Um, can cause mass migrations. We already know of, of things that have happened in Sudan and, then, and uh, Darfur. Uh, what drought can cause as well. So, since last week was the inaugural um, climate, Africa Climate uh, Week, um, which is supposed to start off the um, various climate change um, meetings and, and events throughout the whole year by the United Nations. So this one, obviously was endorsed by President Akufuado of Ghana, um, who is a, a proponent of, of climate change uh, initiatives. Um, so it was held in Accra, Ghana this week uh, with the objectives as I set out um, earlier. But I wanted us to now look at how climate change affects um, the rest of the continent of Africa. Um, and the projections that are said to uh, be looming if we don't, uh, as, as a whole planet, take certain steps. Um, and then obviously the African countries have to be able to make a stand, in my opinion, because if China and the United States and other countries, Western countries in particular, don't make these steps, they're literally signing uh, our death warrant by their inaction. So there has to be a mandate that's made with penalties um, for them to, for them not to take the eye off the ball and not take a stand on climate change. Um, I know we're not in the best position to make these mandates, but together as a, as a, as an entity, as as an African unit, I think we can. But this is just to highlight that the. Um, next meeting uh, for the Climate Action Summit is on the 23rd of September 2019. As I said, it's starting off in, in Accra, Ghana, and there will be numerous other events going on throughout the year. So, I think next is to go on to, okay, the projections. So, uh, if you look at this with me, Namdi, so these are climate projections, and they're expecting a 1.6 to 2.9 increase in temperature by 2050. This is for African countries in particular. Um, there's going to be decreased rainfall, uh, an increased frequency of intense uh, heavy rainfall with a 17 to 45 centimeter rise in sea levels by 2050. Um, that's pretty much within the next 30 years. And that this is just a projection. Um, the acceleration of, of this impact is unpredictable. Um, so, as, is, as, as they expect, there will be reduced water quality and availability, intensifying flood events, 
uh, increased land, land degradation, loss of biodiversity and fisheries, uh, coastal erosion, um, increased food insecurity, which is the, 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 the more dangerous aspect of, lot of, of, of massive malnutrition, um, deaths, migrations, clashes, potential wars. Um, these are things that we shouldn't take lightly. This, as Namdi said, this is one of the greatest threats, if not the greatest threats that we are facing right now as a civilization. And one that I think should be at the forefront of the agenda of many, many of our countries and the African Union as a whole. Um, I'll go on to show you a few more projections. But I don't know, Namdi, did you have anything to add here if I move on? Uh, yeah, I think you, I think you highlighted. I think you've done a brilliant job by highlighting some of the, <clears throat> the short, short and medium term challenges. I mean, you <clears throat> talked about Lake Chad. We, we could already see the impact of the, the drying of the Lake Chad region. You can see how that swelling uh, sectarian and uh, religious crisis in the you know, northeastern part of Nigeria, Chad, Niger, and the uh, parts of Cameroon. See how that swirling crisis, swirling sectarian crisis, in terms of the Boko Haram attack, and uh, uh, how the people will have for centuries um, depended on that particular lake chart for their source of livelihood, for farming, for irrigation, for electricity, and for other processes, and now forced now uh, are now being displaced and now forced to migrate into other areas. Uh, just to survive, and we can see how that migration is fueling conflict in uh, in different parts of Africa. <clears throat> we are aware of the uh, numerous headband clashes that we see uh, that's been recorded on on, uh, on a weekly or a monthly basis in, in different parts of West Africa. I mean, just today it was, it was announced that um, I think I think about about 150 headsmen were, were massacred in Mali. So these are uh, the reflection of some of the uh, uh, a microcosm of some of the, the uh, or an escalation of some of the this uh, uh, environmental challenges that the continent is facing from a regional level and the impact it can have on the entire continent. Um, you also talked about the fact that um, um, the unfortunate fact that the Africa is now not a continent and that is not you know meant to be at the brunt of these environmental challenges, despite the fact that we emit the least amount of uh, CO2. Um, the scientists have said that's responsible for the uh, for an escalation in the climate. Uh, countries that are, that are responsible for this particular uh, uh, environmental challenges, countries like the United States are not even signatory of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And I quite agree with what you said earlier on, that there is need for African countries, because this is, this is a matter of life and death. We're literally fighting for our survival of our own civilizations, civilization of the I think that the, the, African, the African countries and the African Union in particular, we start looking at active measures that they can take to ensure that they bring those countries that, 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 that are Few signed up to this agreement. I still dragging their feet. Or don't even believe in the, the, the whole science of climate change altogether. So begin to take action. Either through either either through measures of sanctions or total isolation. I think we need to begin to look at it because, like I mentioned earlier, this is the greatest threat. Not political. It's not political. Not social. This is the greatest threat the African continent will face in this 21st century. This is the greatest threat. Do you, do, 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 why do you, do you think they do you think they they, they see that or they I don't, I don't think they see, I, I don't think that they they, they they really understood the impact I think as we move deeper into the 21st century I think maybe by then we begin to see the impact of this of this this this, uh, this disaster or this this looming crisis you know we have like you already mentioned we now have countries like Ethiopia and Egypt that are threatening to go to war each other over the control of the Nile. This is a part of the climate change, the escalation of the climate change because we have um, a growing population in Ethiopia. Ethiopia population is growing. That's the second largest population on the continent after Nigeria. 
Egypt's population is growing. Okay, Ethiopia needs water. Needs water. Needs water to power his hydro for hydroelectricity needs to provide electricity supply for for irrigational for agricultural process to feed his populace. Egypt, as we know, the people who live in Egypt predominantly live on the Nile. So they, they need they need the Nile, they need access to the water that comes from the Nile for them to equally survive. So this 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 is the major issue. This is the only way they can have access to water. So we have challenges regarding the changes in the climate, the fluctuation, increase in uh, temperatures, increase in global temperatures, the impact it has on flood, rising temperatures, drying up of lakes and, and, and rivers, and the, 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 the resulting uh, sectarian and religious crisis that, that, the, that, the, that the results are the results that emerges as a result of this. So, uh, and, 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 and how is that? I mean, the, this shows degree rises of three degrees by 2050 and three degrees are quite significant if, if you think about that when you think about some countries already having 38 degree average annual temperatures to have a three degree rise it's going to have severe impact on things like you know here are some risks you know um increased crop failure or uh, oh, food, food oh, it's going to have significant impact on food security Food security. That's going to be one of the first. One of the, that's going to be one of the first casualties. For sure, for sure. I mean, I mean, and and then coastal erosion. We have people who live along the coast again, as you said, in the Nile. When that dries up, that's just a a, a a signal for for migration to other areas with more water, which increase increases um stress on those regions, on on societal uh, cohesion. On, on agriculture, uh, on health, it, it, it's, it's just, and, and these are all industry, or, or I'd say these are all sectors that are largely underdeveloped in some regions. Like, imagine when we had uh, the Ebola crisis, we saw, you know, how at least the first time around when it happened a few years ago, it was quite disastrous, but they've brought it under control through the CDC, the Center for Disease, Disease Control now. But that's a few thousand people. But when we have start, start to have migrations now of tens of thousands of people moving due to this looming crisis, especially with population growth reaching the two billions by 2050, we have a serious crisis on our hands. A serious crisis, an existential one on our hands. As you see here, um, sea level rises, damage to storage facilities, uh, disruption of transport, transportation works, and access to agricultural uh, inputs, increased com conflicts between pastoralists, as we said, farmers, and ex expanding cultivation and altered pasture mobility patterns, early drying of uh, and loss of seasonal water, which we'll come to in, in a moment when we talk about water uh, for livestock. Uh, I mean. Th th this is something that, that needs to be on at the forefront of the African Union's agenda, at the forefront, before anything else, because this is an existential threat. And I want to take you to talking, speaking of water. So, uh, warming temperatures, uh, shifting rainfall patterns, and sea level rises threaten to diminish water quality and also water availability. Uh, with carry-on implications for agriculture, hydropower, commercial and domestic water use across the region. West Africa is highly dependent on transboundary water resources with 11 major transboundary river basins. The Niger River Basin, for example, extends across 10 countries from its source in southeastern Guinea. On average, countries are reliant on a source outside their borders for more than 40% of their water supply, with the exception of island nations. Uh, warming temperatures, uh, shifting rainfall patterns, and sea level rises threaten to diminish water quality and alter water availability uh, with carry-on implications for agriculture, hydropower, commercial and domestic water use across the region. West Africa is highly dependent on transboundary water resources with 11 major transboundary river basins. The Niger River Basin, for example, extends across 10 countries from its source in southeastern Guinea. On average, countries are reliant on a source outside their borders 
or more than 40% of their water supply, with the exception of island nations. More than 90% of the water supply in Mauritania, for example, and Niger, and 50% in Mali and Chad come from outside each country's boundaries. So the situation in Egypt and Ethiopia with the use of the Nile for both their power needs is not unique to them. We have similar situations across the continent, especially Central and West Africa, where this situation is shows the dependency of water sources from other countries, whereby if those countries are not able to manage the climate change demands, it has a follow-on knock-on effect to other countries. So people can't deal with this in isolation. So a summit uh, uh, of the kind that happened a week ago is essential and essential to happen more frequently, to come up with deliberate actions and also crisis management um, initiatives in the pending um, event that such migrations and such catastrophes or, or crises will occur that we're able to mitigate them quickly. So we need to have a crisis management policy across the continent in place um, as soon as possible because we no longer have just countrywide issues and problems. So that needs to be another um, issue that the African Union has to has to has to meet. Um, I'll just highlight this again. So this is just uh, from the uh, article New Scientist, where it talks about the impacts of uh, rising global temperatures. This is from 2007. It shows what happens with each degree rise in temperature and what you expect. So as I mentioned earlier, there's about a three degree rise expected by 2050 in African countries. It says here, um, there's a higher risk of uh, West Africa, um, West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, risk of abrupt changes in monsoon climbs, uh, 3 million people could die from malnutrition. But here, when it gets to 4 degree rise, um, water availability in South Africa and Mediterranean could drop from 30 to 50 percent. Um, South Africa already has um, a, a water problem and there has been rationing, intense rationing in recent days, uh, so in recent weeks. Uh, the African agricultural yields dropped by 15 to 30, 35 percent. Up to 80 million more Africans are exposed to malaria because malaria usually thrives in standing water um, where their eggs and larvae are able to multiply. So when you don't have running, um, um, constant moving water, uh, malaria is likely to thrive even more, further um, taking more lives and causing decreased productivity across the continent. And then there's up to 300 million people um, supposedly who would be affected by coastal flooding. So this again just goes to highlight and really, really, um, you know, stress the point that it is an existential threat to our civilization. Um, as I go on to the next uh, slide, I just want to also highlight that some people um, have taken some some steps um, individually and just to show that we can meet these challenges in different ways. Um, there was a story of William Kamkwamba, who um, was from Malawi, um, and there's a book that was written on him called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, and also a subsequent Netflix movie, which was directed by Chiwetel Ejiofor, a Nigerian-British actor. And uh, based on this boy's life, he was about 13 year or 14 years old in Malawi when a severe drought hit. I think this was about 2011 or 12 and um, they couldn't irrigate their land, they couldn't be able to uh, sell their crops or buy seeds. So people were dying, people were leaving the land, the land was dry, and there was no way for them to irrigate their land. So he, um, in school, he couldn't go to school. He ended up um, having to drop out because his parents couldn't afford it, but he still kept sneaking into the library in school. And because he saw what was happening all around him, He's found a book that showed a, a, a windmill, uh, an electricity windmill, and he read he read the book, and he found out he could make electricity, which could help pump water to irrigate the land for farming. 
and at his age 13 14 he found scrap metal and materials um put them together and made a pump through wind energy so this if a 13 or 14 year old boy can address the needs of climate change and do it singularly on his own at age 13 and 14 then what are those people in power those people who have uh, government budgets at their disposal those people who have um, those government officials elected officials despots whatnot who have the the will who could have the will and the political um say so to get these uh, um, um, get these bills passed and get these things implemented that would protect and lobby and push for the world to address climate change before it starts to take um, a lot of our people. They should look to this boy as, a, as, as the measure of what a will and determination of someone who wants to make a change can do, especially when it comes to climate change. So I thought I'd mention that there. Um, we have... Um, again, I said impending uh, water scarcity. It says for one billion people um, who do not have safe drinking water, there are issues that we, that, or there are, there are fears that this will be um, exponentially increased before the the end of the the middle of the century. Um, so there are solutions. Uh, and Namdi, I think you you watched or read about this. I don't know if you want to talk about this. I found this amusing. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the solutions that is being proposed, uh, <clears throat> I think it was proposed by Bill Gates. And I, <laughs> I know when I mentioned Bill Gates, a lot of people have their, some people have their misconception about it, but I just felt um, um, this particular solution that he was proposing was quite uh, uh, genius, I guess, very, very uh, interesting. So it's essentially a solution that involved the conversion of um, human feces into water. I think again, yeah, um, I first saw it on the, the Daily Show and uh, spent some time to read about it. Uh, I think it's an um, area of research that the uh, UK from the Bill and the Gates Foundation is actually bankrolling. And uh, I think it's largely been successful in the areas that have been piloted. So they are looking at uh, taking this particular solution on a much larger scale and uh, yeah just find it quite interesting over two and a half billion people have no access to safe sanitation we asked brilliant engineers to help us solve this problem and one of those engineers actually has proposed a solution where the waste is valuable the omni processor turns sewer sludge which is kind of nasty into clean drinking water electricity and ash that is pathogen free this is where the sludge enters the machine. It goes up this conveyor belt, is fed into these large tubes we call the dryer. That's where we boil the sludge. And in the boiling process, we separate the water vapor from the solids. The solids are now dry and we can feed them into the fire. Once we have this very hot fire, we can make high pressure, high temperature steam. And we take that steam and we send it to a steam engine. And the steam engine drives a generator that makes electricity that we use for the processor and also excess electricity that can be delivered back to the community. The water vapor that's created in the boiling process is run through a cleaning system until we have the cleanest, purest water you can possibly imagine. The sanitation system as we know it in the developed world cannot work in developing countries. So what we need in developing countries is a very simple system. The entrepreneur that owns this processor will get paid for the input, the sludge. And that same entrepreneur will get paid for the outputs, the electricity, the water, and the ash. I am very impressed with this solution we're seeing here. It generates electricity, it generates clean water. It will grow to every corner of the earth that needs it because it makes money every day. It's water. Um, yeah, I, I found this particular solution quite um, quite ingenious. I think uh, this can be replicated in different parts of the continent. I mean, that's pretty crucial in addressing some of the challenges that we face in the short, medium term. 
and 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 and, it, and, and as you see there, it solves you know, multiple, multiple multitude of problems. Um, it's waste disposal, electricity generation, and water, and then ash for again a, a, another use. Um, th we can have these modular, um, I guess, uh, recycling plants in communities to just solve the problem in communities. And then we can also have, as you see, there was a black engineer there. We could have um, training for in, uh, indigenous engineers to create the, this same template in their own communities. I mean, we have all these, we have all these things to our disposal, but we're still having to wait for the United Nations to 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 come and and give aid and U.S. aid and all these other bits of aid when we can really do it ourselves. So. Um, again, we started off uh, unfortunate um, events and disaster that happened in, in Mozambique and our thoughts go out to them again. But we just wanted to talk about climate change and um, where we are today in the discussion, uh, what is being um, proposed, the impacts that are, that, that, are, that, are that, that are looming on the continent and our people, and just a few suggestions of, of where we can go, what can be done. Um, and we hope yeah, you, you all enjoyed the show. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we'd like to hear that. Um, please leave your comments in the section um, or questions. And do subscribe, like, or dislike if you like. And um, yeah, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, thanks again for watching. And see you next time.